A revolutionary conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall is renowned for a lifetime of work that has changed the world. My mission was to get close to the chimpanzees, to live among them. At the age of just 26, Goodall ventured into the wilds of Tanzania to study chimpanzees. What she discovered upended our understanding of primates and humankind's relationship with the animal kingdom. Chimpanzees are more like people than any other creature on this planet. Six decades on, and the activist is still hard at work, this time with the biggest challenge yet, to protect the natural world. We are literally approaching a point of no return. A fight for humanity has taken her around the globe. So with the spotlight on the global superpowers in the face of the climate crisis, how does China's response stack up? Right now, China has a really super reputation for protecting wildlife and protecting the environment. And will humankind ever learn from the mistakes of our past? So what this pandemic should teach us is that we need to respect animals. Here's Jane Goodall on Talking Post, explaining China's role in conservation, climate change, and why she still has hope for the future. Jane Goodall, thank you for joining us all the way from the UK by video link. A real pleasure and a real privilege to have you on board. You've been at this for six decades now. Do you feel like you could use a break now? Wh where does this boundless energy come from? Where, where, where does this motivation come from? Well, you know, I think the motivation comes from the fact that our world is in a mess right now. And, oh, you yes. know, I mean, we've still got a window of time when we can slow down climate change and loss of biodiversity. But I don't know how big that window is. And it's still closing. Therefore, you know, I've reached the great age of 88. Therefore, I don't know how many years I have left to be active. So I have to speed up. And the energy and motivation comes from the fact that I care about the environment. I care about animals and forests. And I care about, ab about our children and the future. That's why I'm devoting huge amounts of my remaining energy to growing our Jane Goodall Institute Roots and Shoots program. And that is for young people from kindergarten, university, even beyond university. And the main message of this program is every single one of us makes some kind of impact on the planet every day. And we can choose what sort of impact we make. And that's now in 66 countries. It's, it's all around the world and growing all the time. I'm very interested in what your work has been like in China. What's the latest with it? What kind of progress have you have you made? China, yes. Well, it's over, over a thousand groups of roots and shoots right across the country. Um, you know, I used to be going to China once a year. Then it was once every two years. Then came COVID. And now after three years, off the road, every single country wants me there. So, so we're sort of starting with US where most of the money comes from to keep our Africa programs going. Because we're in six different African countries now. And this program to bring people out of poverty. And you know, let me say here that one of the major things that we have to solve, which I think China was, was very good at, is bringing people out of poverty. Because when you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment to survive, cut down trees to make more land, to grow more food, or to make money from charcoal or timber. So bringing people out of poverty, helping them understand that protecting the environment isn't just for wildlife, it isn't just for animals, it's for their own, our own future. Do you feel a tangible difference now that uh, uh, people in China being more prosperous, that it has impacted on conservation, especially with animals? Can I would say so. <clears throat> right now, China has a really super reputation for protecting wildlife and protecting the environment. You know, tree planting and think what's happened with the pandas. Many examples where China is playing an important role in conservation. What was it like when you first started in China in the old days? Just to give us an idea of how much progress has been made, can you are you able to quantify it or give us an idea? Well, I can't quantify, but I can say that 
when I first went, it was, I think, 1994, 95, something like that. And it was just when China was opening up to the idea of conservation. It was, the timing was absolutely perfect. It was just about one conservation organization in the country. And, you know, people were beginning to talk about conservation. And it's very, very different now. And of course, there's much less poverty. And the young people are changing their parents. You know, I had a wonderful letter from a mother in China. And she said, well, you know, until my daughter started Roots and Shoots in her school and persuaded me to help, I was just a woman and I went shopping and I didn't think about what I bought. But now she said, I think about it. I ask myself, you know, is, is am I making an ethical choice? So, you know, it, it's changing all the time and young people are the key to the future, I think. What do you think of how far we've progressed in Hong Kong in terms of conservation? Recently, uh, we've had uh, uh, laws coming into effect with ivory, for example. Uh, shark's fin is, has become a bit of a dirty word as well in Hong Kong. There has been some progress. Have you been able to see it in your work? Do you have anything concrete? Well, I've certainly seen it with ivory and, and shark's fins. And, you know, I'm told that the only problem with shark's fin in many places is for weddings, because it's supposed to make men more virile. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, in China, shark's fin was banned from all government um, ceremonies, mm -hmm. and ivory was banned, the importation of ivory was banned. The problem there was that the ivory dealers moved into countries around China so that they got away from that ban. But, you know, that's where we need to do more work to educate the people in the countries where the ivory dealers moved. And of course, it's this animal traffic in the illegal animal wildlife trade. It's really, really difficult and it's very corrupt and huge amounts of money are being made. So many people tackling this uh, in Africa and so on, they're actually risking their lives. Let's get to the issue of climate change. Um, and climate change denial in particular. Seems like we're going backwards instead of moving forwards in, in a lot of ways. Science is questioned now. Science is, uh, there are extreme reactions to science as you saw during COVID uh, prevention. How do you fight against such powerful odds? Isn't it exhausting? First of all, I, I tell stories about my own personal experience of climate change. Also, we have to keep in mind that it's all about money. So when a big company uh, doesn't want to change the way it operates because, uh, because of the production of emissions leading to these greenhouse gases, um, th they're very powerful. They're a very powerful lobby. And this, this really is the problem. And that and ignorance, people not understanding, but mostly it's about money and corruption, I think. Because, I mean, climate change, my goodness, it's so obvious. Weather patterns have changed all around the world. You know, worse hurricanes and flooding and uh, droughts and worse of these terrible forest fires, more heat waves, more people dying from these, more money being spent. And if politicians don't listen, it can only mean that it's to do with, with, with pressure from the big corporations. Good news. The corporations are changing. So my method of dealing with people isn't to argue, it isn't to present cold, hard facts. It's to try and tell stories that reach the heart. Looking back at the last uh, couple of years where the whole world has been paralyzed and affected by COVID, what lessons do you think uh, are there for us to learn from COVID in terms of conservation and protecting animals and uh, you know uplifting the human condition? But also, what lessons do you think that we're failing to learn as well? Well, um, some people are failing to learn all of the lessons and other people, you know, are more with it. But basically, uh, COVID is one of those diseases which can be passed from an animal to a human. And there are many of these diseases. They're known as zoonotic diseases. And as we destroy habitats, we push some animals closer to people. As we 
capture animals and they go around the world in the illegal uh, trafficking, animal trafficking. You know, this means they're being sold in wildlife markets in unhygienic conditions in different parts of the world. So you, you're pushing animals and people closer and that gives much more opportunity for a bacteria or a virus to jump from an animal to a person when it may create a new disease. And, you know, it's not just wild animals. It's the factory farms where we keep billions of animals around the world in terrible conditions. And that's produced many zoonotic diseases as well. So what this pandemic should teach us is that we need to respect animals. As it is, COVID kept me where I'm speaking to you from now is from the house I grew up in. Mm. And it's owned by me and my sister. This is where I was for over two and a half years through throughout COVID. And it's the most exhausting time I had in my whole life, much more exhausting than traveling around the world as I was before, because I could Zoom, you know, four Zooms a day, like what I'm talking to you now. I could be doing three more in different parts of the world. And I didn't have one day off, not one weekend, not one holiday. This COVID has affected you personally quite hard as well, right? in terms of your conservation efforts and the work you do? Well, first of all, let me clear, make it clear that I'm now back on the road again. Okay. This is a five day gap between just coming back from the United States and just on my way to various European countries. But um, yes, during, during that time when I was stuck here, I reached millions, not hundreds or thousands, but millions more people around in many more countries around the world. That's how it shot up. And that's how the message I have has gone further and further around the world. Is awareness the biggest uh, tool? Or you, you talked about money, why money is important as well. And you did mention that uh, you're encouraged by corporations being more uh, active and more uh, uh, susceptive to the message. Or are there so many setbacks now, as you can see, with all the opposition and, and the animals are not important, let's get on with life first, human beings first, war, refugees, that kind of stuff. I wish I could wave a wand, but you know how I see it now. I see our species as at the mouth of a very, very long and very dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star shining, and that's hope. And it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and saying, well, I, I wonder when that star will come to us. No, we've got to, hope is for me is about action. We've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to crawl under, climb over, work our way around all these problems between us and the star. We've mentioned many of them, alleviating poverty, um, helping people to become less ignorant, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and these and all the other problems. You know, the good news, there are groups of people working to try and solve every single one. Um, the bad news is that so often all these groups are working in their own isolated little silo, not realizing because they're not thinking of the whole problem and the interrelatedness of everything. They're not realizing, oh, great, we've closed down this coal mine. Yay, we're stopping all these emissions going up into the greenhouse gases. Not realizing that, okay, we've put many people out of work and in order to survive, they're going to harm the environment just to, just to keep going. So it, it's necessary for us to understand the interweaving of everything that's going on more collaboration, more people working together. That's what's so important. You've spent all your life protecting uh, animals. You started with the chimpanzees. What will it take to protect the chimpanzee's closest cousin, which is us, humanity, at the rate that it's going? What will it take? Well, more education, more awareness, roots and shoots. I want it to be everywhere. Because, you know, roots and shoots, it's not political. Uh, it, it can work in any, any country. I haven't found a single country where any government has said, oh, we don't like this program. Because it's, it's empowering young people 
to make the right choices to save the environment for the future, to alleviate poverty, and to think about things as a whole. So it, it's my one greatest hope for the future. But then another hope is the resilience of nature. And you've got many examples of that in China, places we totally destroyed, rivers that were absolutely polluted. And, you know, given time or help, nature can start replenishing, coming back once again, welcoming animal life, insects, birds, and so on. And then, you know, an, another reason for hope is the human brain. We're beginning to use it wisely. Uh, we're beginning to use it to find solutions like uh, alternative energy, renewable energy. And again, China's doing a pretty good job there with solar, with wind and so on. And then finally, what I call the indomitable spirit, the people who tackle what seems absolutely impossible and they don't give up and they may succeed. Jane, when you look back at your work, uh, what single uh, achievement are you proud of the most that you can legit say that, you know, this, I'm, I'm so proud of this, I'm so happy I did this. And what do you want your legacy to be? Well, actually, I have to say two things. One is starting Roots and Shoots. I, I think that may, in the end, be the most important thing. But the other is to do with animals. When I first went to university, I'd been with the chimps for two years. I'd learned a lot about them, how like us they are, you know, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, sharing food. Oh, they also have a dark and aggressive side, but they also have an altruistic side. And I hadn't been to college, but I went to Cambridge University in England because my mentor, Lewis Leakey, said, Jane, for scientists to take you seriously, you have to get a degree. And he got me involved in a PhD. And imagine how I felt when I was told by these erudite professors, Jane, you've done everything wrong. You shouldn't have named the chimps. They should have had numbers. You can't talk about their personalities, their minds or their emotions, because those things are unique to the human. You can't talk about them having culture. Uh, there's a difference in kind between all animals and humans. But in the end, you know, the chimpanzees and my then husband, his film began going around. And then science discovered that the difference genetically between us and chimps was only just over 1%. And so people had to accept from all this evidence that it's a difference of degree, not kind. As Darwin said over a hundred years ago, he knew. And so gradually people have begun to understand who animals are, that they all have their personalities. Uh, and, you know, anybody who's had a good relationship with a dog, a cat, a horse, they know that. And I think that the scientists knew it, but they were worried because they couldn't prove it. Um, now it's generally accepted. Jane, your message of hope is very important. Uh, we've come to the end of this uh, conversation, but uh, I will spread the word among our audience as well. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for joining us and uh, sharing some of your experience and wisdom with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you too. <laughs>